Shall we slowly make a start? Yes. So welcome guys uh, back to Bridging the Gap. So today's talk will be by Dr. Uh, Sheetha, who is a uh, GPSG2 uh, working in the East England Deanery. Um, so thank you so much for doing this talk for us. Um, it will be a case-based discussion like we always do. So we'll try and make it as interactive as we can. And if you guys don't mind typing in the chat um, what you guys think is going on with regards to the case, that would be great. And we'd also um, appreciate if we can, um, if you guys can fill in some feedback for her, for her building her portfolio and things, um, that would be really nice. And yeah, you'll get a certificate of attendance if you do fill it in. I think that's it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll get started. Okay. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday and, you know, sitting here with me for medicine, which um, is never great on a very sunny morning or sunny evening, shall I say. It's a whopping 27 degrees here. Um, so it's really hot. <laughs> and you guys are sitting in front of the computer. So hats off to you. Before I begin, can I just ask all of you to just put it in the chat, you know, which year you are, where are you from, were you studying med, um, you know, anything of that sort. So we've got a mix of people. So I just want to know what's the highest amount, like where are you, where are you studying medicine in which year you are? If you could just jot that down, that would be great. Okay, so for the people who've just joined, um, I was just telling everyone if you could just jot down in the chat box which year you're studying med in and where you are so that, you know, we have a idea as to what's happening. Lovely. Okay, we've got a few people <laughs> typing in. Well, one, but okay. Gonna wait for a few more seconds because I'm sure there's a few people who can type. Tough crowd. Come on, guys. It's just one of you. I just want somebody to write more as to where you've studied from. I'm going to give you a complete full-blown introduction about me, so don't worry about that. But I'm just waiting for a few more responses. Yikes. Is everybody just bored on a Saturday? Or are you just here for like the attendance and the certificate kind of thing <laughs> which to be fair even I've done okay multiple times I'm just like I cannot be bothered but what I'm trying to do is try and make this as interactive as possible because eventually you guys are going to be where we are and you will have to go through this regardless of you know of your career you know you will have to go through doing a CBD with your trainer and trying to figure out how to do a good CBD. Okay, so let's start. If you guys would still like to put in, the chat is still completely open, but I'm going to start anyways, all right? Okay. I'm just gonna share my desktop because this is all I can do. Okay, so I'm hoping everybody can see my um, screen. Uh, dun, dun, dun. There we go. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Thank God. We've got somebody replying. Okay. Firstly, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. I'm going to make it very quick and very short for you guys um, because I know it's a Saturday and nobody really wants to be here on a Saturday but I'm hoping I make it as impactful as possible because it's very impossible to sit through an entire lecture trying to grasp everything but if it's short you guys will get 
a lot of things in regardless okay so it's impact more than you know the time taken to do this right so my name is dr ashita Nair. i am a gp sd2 that means i'm in my second year of gp training i'm currently in the east of england deanery if uh, nobody knows where that is that is the utmost east of it of the entire england map i'm in a little city called norwich and um yeah i've basically started i'm almost going to become gpsc3 in august which is not too far away and that will be my last year of training if I get through all my exams. So that's um, a, a kind of like an obstacle, isn't it? But we'll see. Right, so my timeline, I graduated med school in 2016 and to whoever's just graduated recently, yes, I am old, I understand. Do not judge me for that, okay? Um, I graduated med school in 2016 in India, and then I had one year experience in India where I kind of moved around a and &E, uh, renal, and a bit of endocrinology as well. And then I took my PLAB 1 in 2018, and then I did my PLAB 2 in 2019, after which I started my first NHS job as a junior clinical fellow in HPB surgery in 2019, towards the end of it, in King's College Hospital London. I did that for a couple of years. Um, did a lot of liver transplants and ripples and things like that. And then I completely switched my careers 180 degrees and went into GP training, which people thought I was crazy. But I thought it was much better for me to not put my hands in somebody's abdomen at two o'clock in the morning when I'm absolutely tired. So I took that decision for myself. All right. Now let's start. Now, I want to know what is your understanding of a case-based discussion? Okay, what, what do you mean or what do you feel a case-based discussion is? If you can just put that on the chat, I will be very happy. Any one of you? Because I'm going to just stare at the screen till I actually get a reply. So uh, apologies for that. But um, I'm trying to make the tough crowd not as tough. That's what I'm trying to do. If you don't want to chat, you can, you know, if you don't want to like type it in, you can just unmute yourselves and say it. Don't want to see your face, but you know. Well, that's a very, well, okay. So we had somebody just tell us in the chat is you probably tell us a case, we try and answer, probably fail, and then you tell us the answer. Guys, no, that is not what a CBD is. Okay. Let me just tell you what exactly a CBD is. A CBD is when you actually sit with your trainer. I've got a slide on it, all right? Just you as a trainee sit with your trainer or your educator or your supervisor, whoever it is, and you discuss a case. Now, ideally, in the ideal, all sorts of RCPs and, you know, from the Royal College, what kind of um, this one that they give or, you know, guidelines that they give for a CBD is where you present two to three cases to your trainer, the trainer picks one, and then you kind of dissect it. Now, why we do a CBD is basically to help the trainer understand how you've gotten through this and possibly give you a bit more feedback on how you could have done a little bit more better. So this is just mainly for your growth rather than anything. I remember when I first came to this country and I had absolutely no idea what a CBD was because duh, stupid me, came into this country not knowing what it is, whereas all of you have been doing that since like you started med school. And suddenly I had my trainer look at me saying that, are you the most dumbest girl in the world? Because this is not what you do a CBD with. And, and honestly, I think, you know, it's very difficult especially for somebody coming from another country, coming here and trying to figure out what the system is like. So for all those people who basically studied in Varna and you know, not particularly the people who studied in Leeds is the fact that it is a different 
completely different scenario here. But CBD is not something that you fail in. CBD is something that you kind of learn from and then you go forward from there, okay? So definitely so not something that you fail in, all right? So let's just start, okay? So uh, I've just put this in um, just to give you a little bit of an um, idea of what a CBD is. A CBD is a case-based discussion, is essentially a structured interview between the educator and the trainee. The aim is to explore professional judgment exercised in clinical cases. Now, this attributes required objectives um, to do this may include you recognize uncertainty and complexity. So as a trainee, you pick this case because you feel, you know, it was something, it, it was an obstacle in your learning. You didn't know what to do. So obviously that kind of uncertainty is there. So you pick that case, but you use your medical knowledge or you use the ethical and legal framework or whatever it is in the case and help go take the case forward. And you're able to prioritize. You're able to give options to the patient. You're able to consider implications and justify the decisions that you've taken. What you could have done better, that will come from the educator or from the supervisor. But this is what you do, okay? Now, let's talk about the first case, right? Guys, let me just tell you this. I've got only two cases today, and this is not particularly something to do with a certain subject. But what I'm trying to do is try and make you understand how to go about a CBD or how to go about a case, right? So let's start the first case. We have a 75 year old woman who presents with right groin pain since three months. Gradual onset, it's, they describe it as a nagging pain. I'm really sorry. I did realize that I've put his and her over there. It is actually a man, not a woman. Wakes up from sleep, finds walking slightly difficult. He is retired. So it is a guy. He is retired and does not work anymore. His past medical history consists of atrial flutter for which he's on a beta blocker and an anticoagulant. His beta blocker is bisoprolol and his anticoagulant is edoxaban. On examination, there is restricted hip flexion. Knee joint is intact. No tenderness is felt on palpation of the groin region. Vital stable. So it is a man, okay? So this is your patient. He's come to you. Okay, sorry, not a, a woman. It is a man. 75-year-old has come to you. He's got pain and you do all of this. Okay, this is your case in front of you. Right? Now, my first question to all of you is, would you have any other further questions that you would like to ask this particular patient of yours? The chat box is open as always. I can, yep. Okay, we've got a few ans um, questions coming in. Okay. Does everybody know what Socrates is? I hope you do, because that's like um, a basic history drinking from med school. But that's just basically the pain scale, as in you ask, you know, the onset, the duration, all of that in terms of pain. So anything else that you would like to ask this man? History of swelling. Okay, that's another question that you can ask him. Anything else? Associated symptoms. Yep. Yes. What was his job? That was very important. What is his job? Has he had any fall, some kind of traumatic incident? Absolutely correct. Anything else that any, anybody else can think of? Exactly. That's what I was looking for as well. What's his weight? How active is he? And, you know, things like that. Now, 
I'm just going to ask Joel one more thing because you had written associated symptoms. Is there anything in particular that, um, you know, if you've read the case, you probably should have had some kind of time, you know, differential in your mind. Is there any particular associated symptom that you are kind of worried about or you are, you know, you can relate with this case? So he's got hip pain, right? What's the, what associated symptoms are you thinking? Bursting on exertion, okay, fine. Anything else? We've come to the differentials already. Let's just stick to the first further questions, yeah? Differentials, you can definitely put in the differentials if you want to. Just talking about in terms of associated symptoms, is there anything else other than worsening on exertion that exertion that you would be concerned about? Nothing else? Oh. Headaches. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. I mean, I understand the headaches point of view is because he's on anticoagulants. But in terms of, okay, he's got the hip pain, you wouldn't necessarily co correlate that with headaches, isn't it? Like, in terms of his hip pain, what are the next associated symptoms that you can possibly think about? Fever. Gilly, why why fever? Why have you put fever? What's that? What's the differential in your mind? I was thinking maybe there's like a septic arthritis thing or like an abscess. Or yeah, anything. exactly. Don't forget the red flags, guys. I think that's the one thing that you need to remember is, you know, any kind of pain at any point of time, if it's particularly a joint pain, ask about the red flags and one of the red flags is fever because you know it could be a source of abscess over there we don't know if it is a let's just say a psoas abscess or any kind of muscle abscess that is formed over there it's not going to be shown as a swelling isn't it it's going to be way more interior than an external change okay so We've had quite a lot of people talk about a lot of, you know, further questions that he's um, that you would ask. Firstly, history of swelling, that is absolutely correct. You know, you would ask any history of swelling. Now, when you think about history of swelling, and if he says, yes, I do have swelling, what is the first thing that you will think about? What is your differential in this case? Yep, okay, exactly. Anything else? red flags if there is history of swelling no okay sometimes you can think about tumors bone tumors can have history of swelling as well so obviously it depends on what type of swelling when you do a full examination and you check if there is swelling over there um you would either think about whether it's a hernia or whether you know it's any kind of bony firm hard tumors kind of picture now i love the fact that a lot of you thought about his job so psychosocial history is very important okay um, why this is important? Because you are going to ask him what his job is. Now, what if he was a 75-year-old builder, right? And he builds. He's not retired, but he builds. And what you've realized is that he fell down from his roof or when he was building a roof, he fell down. So that could be a possible, you know, a fracture. But he, if he's mobilizing, it could be a hairline fracture. You never know, Right. There's one other thing that, you know, some of you have 
possibly missed. It's been, no, well, not missed. I would even ask about over-the-counter medication history. The only reason being, if he is taking any kind of medications over the counter, that could possibly cause avascular necrosis of his femoral, of the femoral head or anything of that sort, that could cause hip pain as well. Avascular necrosis particularly is not medication uh, associated, but that's also a differential that you just need to remember. Again, it's not going to present like this. All right, this is not going to be the presentation of it. Now, you guys have talked about traumatic incident, what his um, you know, job is, his weight. Now, what if this guy was maybe 160 kilos? That could be, you know, one of the main reasons as to why he's getting this little groin pain over there, right? Now, it's very important that you actually have a face-to-face -face discussion with this man for an examination rather than a, you know, just a telephonic call. Now, it gets very difficult because these all cases, the, the cases that I've put in today is all from my personal experience, which I probably would have seen in the last week. So there was another patient that I saw very recently who came in for a face-to-face -face examination because one of my colleagues had had a chat with him over the phone and he kept saying that he's got severe right abdominal pain. Now, when you talk about right-sided abdominal pain, and he said lower abdominal pain, what's the first thing that you would think about? I'm sorry I'm deviating from this a little bit, but I do tend to do this. When I think about something, I start deflecting. Um, more than happy if you guys don't want to talk about it, we can come back, but I think this is just very important. Yes. So you've got appendicitis, right-sided abdominal, lower abdominal pain. What else can you think about? Now, if this wasn't a man, if it was a woman, what else would you think about? Yep, ovarian torsion. That's another thing that you can think about, okay? So obviously this really, really old man who looked like Santa Claus, okay? I swear to God, he walked in like Santa and I was like, this is Santa Claus walking to my room, great. And he goes, I have right abdominal pain. And I'm like, okay, right. I know that I can see that from the notes. Let's have a look. And he directly shows me to the back of his, um, you know, of his tummy. And I'm like, so that's not right abdominal pain. That is possibly right flank pain radiating to the back. And he goes like, no, that is my tummy. So do you see how things changed completely from when they were talking on the phone and then when you see this person who's come in with right flank pain, which has been there for over multiple years. It's, he's been complaining of this for years now and nobody's found a cause. They've done CTs, they've done ultrasounds, they've done any possible thing, every possible thing under the book to see if what's the cause of the pain and they can't find one. He is obese, yes. So he probably should be losing a lot, losing weight, but his previous history of strokes kind of in, impairs him. Could be psychosomatic, exactly. It could be psychosomatic. Now, when you have these kind of cases, when they say, okay, fine, you can't find a cause for it. What would you do? What would you do for this particular person? You think it's psychosomatic, but you have to give the patient some kind of, you know, management plan. What are you going to do? Yeah, pretty much. Reassurance of further specialist management. That is absolutely correct. Now, as I said, now he's been investigated thoroughly and that was all under the specialist involvement as well. And my God, if you are planning to get an orthopedic referral done for a patient who's complaining of right back pain, love, you're not going to get it anytime soon. It's going to be a two-year waiting list. So <laughs> you're never going to get it. Idiopathic, that is also another thing that you could even think about. Is it idiopathic? Or is he basically saying, is he doing things that we don't know about? 
Or the other thing is, does he just want to come in and just see anybody and just talk to the doctors for like 10 minutes, isn't it? Because a lot of old people who do live alone could be malingering as well. Yes. But it's not the fact that he is, you know, I, I, I particularly feel there's a little bit of a gray area with older or elderly patients because they just want to come in and see somebody and talk to somebody. And it could be under the pretense of, you know, I have abdominal pain or whatever. But somebody to be like, yes, I care for you. And because of that, we, especially in the Norwich area, we have lots and lots of elderly people who come in just for a chat. So kind of like just brushing things under the carpet does not always work. All right. Sometimes you just have to go with the, go with the flow. But obviously, do not think everybody is like that. Investigate properly. Reassure the patient. And if the patient keeps coming back, you just have to accept it, isn't it? Now, if he keeps coming back like 20 times in a year, I would be a little worried. But if it's once every six months, it's probably because he wants a chat. All right. So don't brush everything under the carpet, but just think about what you can and cannot do. Now, completely deflected, let's come back to this case over here. What are your differential diagnosis? Or, you know, you can think about the case. So if you guys want me to go back to the previous slide, let me know. But I can give you a little bit of a short gist about it. 75-year-old, groin pain, restricted hip flexion, um, vital stable. What are your differentials? Stones RCC, yep. Acute pancreatitis, okay. Okay. We've had one person say arthritis as well, so that's absolutely correct. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask about acute pancreatitis. Right groin pain. Why do you think it is acute pancreatitis? With Restricted hip flexion. Inguinal hernia? Maybe, maybe not. Muscle pain? Yeah, maybe. Renal calculi? Could be. We never know. Acute pancreatitis, I think, is a bit. So, acute pancreatitis, I wouldn't particularly say acute pancreatitis just because. Um, First of all, pancreatitis or well, pancreas is mainly in the epigastric region, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So when you have acute pancreatitis, it's not going to be with restricted hip flexion. You might have a lot of other kind of history also coming along with it, but restricted hip flexion is just a bit of an odd one. And especially right groin pain, very rare. At least I haven't seen any, so... Coming from the fact that I've done two years in HPV, I haven't seen anybody with a right groin pain for acute pancreatitis. Okay, so you guys have told me all of your differentials, okay? And I think all of your differentials are absolutely wonderful as well. And I don't think you've missed anything. You've covered from the muscle pain, you've covered osteoarthritis, you've covered hernia, you've covered, you know, possibly even renal calculi. Yep. What is your next step in management? What would you do next? You have all these differentials in your brain. Can you tell your patient, yes, sir, I think you might be having all of this. Ultrasound, okay. Yes. Investigations, yep. Yeah. Question is what, like if you are planning investigations, what investigations are you planning to do? X-ray, X-ray, ultrasound. Okay, what else? Multiple myeloma. Could be, could be, MRI, yup. What else? I don't understand what baseline is. Baseline what? Abdominal pelvic USG, yup. Routine bloods, yes. I think you've covered everything. CT, we've got all, all the imaging thrown out there as well as bloods, as well as every possible imaging under the sun. Now, on examination, you've figured out this guy has got restricted hip flexion, okay? So there's definitely something wrong with the joint per se, right? You've 
palpated the groin and there's no really pain over there, but he does say that the pain when he walks is on the groin. Okay. You've tried cough impulse, nothing negative, no swelling, nothing. For every patient, now this is coming purely from a primary care perspective. For every patient, we would, we would do bloods. And it's not just routine bloods. We would add in a few other things in there. Yes, you've got your blood count and your, you know, I don't understand why we're going to do um, a kidney function. No, sorry, a liver function for all of this. But there's one particular blood test that you would add in. Actually, there's one particular thing that you guys haven't told me in the, um, the differentials. Calcium, yes. Now, somebody said multiple myeloma. Would you do just a calcium for that? If you think about multiple myeloma, what is that one... Uh, what is that test call that you would add in for? When you have now multiple myeloma usually presents as you know an elderly person with lower back pain, things, serum electrophoresis. That's exactly what you would do. Okay, in primary care you can only do that serum electrophoresis. You can't do anything else. So that is the maximum that you can do. You can add that on, including the calcium and renal function and all of that. Um. Now, what else? Now, that's we talked about multiple myeloma, but there's one particular screen that I would suggest all of you to do, regardless as a baseline, would be your ANAs, your um, rheumatoid factors. Yes. Does that make sense? Why would we would why we would do a rheumatoid factor for this person? Did rheumatoid arthritis come into anybody's, you know, did you think about rheumatoid arthritis? Yes, exactly, rheumatism. So don't forget that, you know, RA, OA, yes. But in terms of OA particularly, what are you going to do in bloods? Like if you, you know, when you look at bloods, what are you going to like? There's nothing diagnostic for osteoarthritis in bloods, isn't it? CRP, it's, can I be honest? When I've looked at um, osteoarthritis particularly, for most of the patients, their ESR and CRPs are absolutely normal. They don't have a raised ESR and CRP. Their bloods are better than mine, can I be honest? Yes, in theory, you know, in all the books that we read, we see, oh, th there can be chances of increased or raised CRP and ESR. But honestly, osteoarthritis is, is a clinical as well as an imaging diagnosis. Yes, in rheumatoid arthritis, there is chances that you can get an elevated CRP, but it's not diagnostic. What is diagnostic for our, you know, when you do one particular blood test, okay, that is something that, anti-CCP. Guys, it's not rheumatoid factor. Rheumatoid factor is only, um, positive for very less number of patients. Anti-CCP is positive for 80% of the patients that have got rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid factor, on the other hand, could be just about 25 to 50%. TSDNA definitely comes under that entire panel, but for rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, particularly anti-CCP, anti something that you have to do. Include that with rheumatoid factor as well. So those two, anti-CCP and rheumatoid factor is what you have to do, all right? So you've got this guy in front of you, okay? You've got, you know, things going on in your head. What would you tell your patient? Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I made these slides when I was half asleep. So my entire grammar has gone out of the window. But what would you tell your patient? Not what would you tell your patient? What would you tell your patient? Next. patient sitting there let's say I'm a patient okay I'm gonna say oh doctor I don't know what this is this pain is like absolutely terrible isn't it I can't walk I can't do anything I mean it's really it's really upsetting and I just want to know what it is what do you know what this is how do you take the consultation from there patient's asking for a diagnosis Yes, 
you would say that, you know, we're going to investigate and try and figure out what the underlying cause is. Okay, fine. As a patient, I might accept that. But as a patient, I might say, but you might have some clue what it could be, isn't it? Do you have a slight less inkling? If you do, can you tell me what it is? Okay, so somebody's written a view of the differentials, maybe the main ones it could be, and then also say it could be something very minor and say I'm doing further tests to confirm. Exactly. Okay. The patient will keep asking you for a definite, definitive diagnosis. Never say a definitive diagnosis. What you could say is it could be anything underneath. So I usually tell my patients, listen, it could be anything under the sun. Okay. It could be absolutely anything under the sun. And which I can't say at the moment because most of the joint issues or, you know, big joints or lower joint issues needs to be investigated, investigated further. So I probably tell them it could range from a muscle pain or it could range to something else completely. But I can't tell you definitive what it is, but rather I would do some investigations and then we'll confirm. And you'll hear from me soon. Okay. Now the patient's not happy. Patient's like, no. Well, you know, the wait list is going to be such a long time now. Bloods are going to be in about three weeks. I don't know what to do in the meantime. Well, you're the doctor there. What are you going to do? Painkillers? Yeah. What painkillers? Does anybody know? Do you want to tell me? Just for a little bit of a background before you type on which painkillers you're going to give. A little bit of a background. This guy has been um, taking paracetamol. Now, if you don't remember, his past medical history consisted of an anticoagulant and a um, bisoprolol, which is the beta blocker. And he was told previously not to have an NSAID with his anticoagulant. Right, go. What are you going to do now? And he's been taking paracetamol. What is the next possible step that you can, you can do? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Cocodamol is usually the most preferred one, especially with, with aged people, 75 years, who's a little old man. You don't want to like kill him with, you know, codeine and morphine and possibly even giving him like buprenorphine and just like, you don't want to do that. You will get sued. Um, so let's start something small. Okay, you start with the Cocodamol. Although, although, yes, that is the pain ladder. You could possibly give him a bit of NSAID, isn't it? Yes, he's taking a doxaban. Cocodamol is a paracetamol and codeine. So you can give that, give that as a step up after um, you've tried your simple analgesia because it's not as strong as just giving complete codeine. Okay. But there is a bit of an NSA that you can give him. What do you think about that? Giving him, giving the 75 year old, oof, not diclofenac. No, not diclofenac. So you've got a 75 year old complaining of groin pain. There's one naproxen, no, that's a bit more further. Isn't it? It's a bit step up from ibuprofen is and naproxen is a little bit more stronger than ibuprofen. And if they've said told him not to take ibuprofen itself, hmm, do you think he'll he's gonna be saying okay to naproxen? He does not want to die of a GI bleed. We do not want to get that on us. You're gonna you will prescribe him an NSA. But which one? Ugh, no, not aspirin. See, aspirin is only used in migraines, which is 900 milligrams. Celecoxib is 
is correct to a certain extent. It is also a type of NSAID. Yes, it's a COX-2 inhibitor, but it is also a type of NSAID. Guys, it's the most simplest thing that you can do for a patient who's got pain. If you want to give an NSAID, we are going to give him topical NSAID. Just rub a bit of ibuprofen on that area, isn't it? Start simple, guys. I know everybody thinks about diclofenac and aproxen aspirin. This poor chap has not touched NSAIDs because somebody's told him not to, which is fair enough, absolutely correct. But what is the harm of rubbing in a little bit of fenbit gel onto his joint? Anybody have any kind of objections to that little statement that I said? Did anybody think about topical NSA? That's also another thing that I wanted to ask you about and just refuse to like put it in because we didn't know if it was correct. No, I know. Start simple. I think that's the one thing that you got to do, especially in primary care, is you start simple. Ask him to rub a bit of NSA down to that, okay? A lot of people try these uh, biofreeze gels and deep heats and things like that. Hmm. You can, you can do, don't know if it works. But with any kind of joint pain history, I usually tell people to go in terms of, you know, ice, you know, application of ice and heat alternatively if they want to. Or, you know, if they want to stick to a certain one, they can. But the most simplest thing that you can do, especially for all these elderly people, will definitely have a history of taking at least 13 to 14 medications. And you do not want to add on to that because they won't like it. You are not going to add on to that list of medications by adding one more tablet. But giving, saying them topical is something that they can do? Yes. Now, I'm not quite sure if you guys noticed something on the history. I'm just going to go back, which I'm going to have to exit to go back because, no, it's not letting me go back. Right. Give me a second, guys. Uh, right. So sorry about that. I'm just going to go back and share this again. Right. So. There's one thing in this history that strikes you as a red flag. What is it? Well, it's stricken me. So anybody just look at this history and do you want to tell me what Chronic pain, okay, three months, well, okay. It's not really a red flag, is it? Read the history again and just think. There is one particular red flag that I would be concerned about for any patient. Yeah, guys. Well, it's wake, wakes up from sleep, nighttime pain. For any person, regardless of whether it's a joint, whether it's an organ, any kind of thing, all of the patients who come to you and tell you that I wake up from sleep because of this, whether it's a headache, whether it's, you know, whether it's incontinence, whether it's, you know, joint pain, it is a red flag. Because you then realize that it is so bad that they have to wake up from their sleep and sleep is when you're absolutely exhausted and you're tired and your body goes into a full shutdown, isn't it? So if anybody comes to you and tells you that I get up in the night because of this pain, or it's, I wouldn't really be too fussed when they say I can't go to sleep properly. But once they've fallen asleep and then they get up, that's not right. Because of, because of the pain, that's not right. 
So this person who presented to me, this, this lovely gentleman who presented to me, came to me and told me that he's got pain when he lies down. He does not really get up from sleep. I put it there just because I wanted you all to pick it up. But he doesn't get up from sleep. But when he lies down, he's got the pain. He's got the pain which impacts his sleep. So what he does to make it a bit more easier is he puts a little bit of a pillow underneath his uh, buttock region so as to ease the pain. And it helps him. I said, okay, if that helps you, great. But he's not getting up from sleep. So that was something I was happy about. But in this particular case scenario, I just want everybody to understand. I just wanted everybody to know that, you know, if anybody comes to you, if any patient tells you that, you know, listen, I'm getting from, you know, getting up from sleep due to this, think a little bit more harder because nighttime or, you know, waking up from sleep due to pain is never normal. All right. So don't brush that off underneath the carpet. So we've talked about ice. Now, what ice is, is ideas, concerns, and expectations. The first thing that, you know, when after you take the history, I usually ask the patient, what are your ideas on it? Okay, what do they think? Because a lot of people Google. Google is the go-to thing over here at the moment, isn't it? So Google is, they're happy with Googling and they think, oh my gosh, I have cancer. So it's your job to kind of say, no, you don't have cancer or we will figure that out. Okay. What they're concerned about dying from cancer. So again, you got to reassure that they're not dying from cancer. Okay. And what are the expectations? Now, when we say about expectations is what they want us to do further. And I'm sure most of the patients want us to like figure out what's happening, but some of them will come with a completely wacky request. Now, because this guy is 75, he's not going to come with a wacky request. There was a particular person who was a bit more younger, 55-year-old, who had similar symptoms, right? Who came with a request saying that, listen, I don't want you to, I'm sure this is just a bit of a muscle pain. This is going to go off. I just want you to write a, a sick note for three months. Bruh, I ain't doing that. But trying to figure out what the expectations of there is very very important okay now i've just basically written here what we're going to do a few blood tests are organized an x-ray of the right hip is done it shows severe degeneration of the right hip right hip joint okay now you call back the patient and you tell him these are your x-ray results and he goes, great doctor, what next? What would you do next, budding doctors? Please tell me that. Refer to orthopedic department, okay. Referral, lovely. Anybody else want to tell me anything different? Lifestyle management now. It gets a bit tricky with this kind of particular people because obviously he is restricted in terms of doing exercise because of his pain, so he can't do it further. So that balance might be a bit difficult, but yes, you can definitely say in terms of diet, in terms of if he's smoking like 500 cigarettes a day to stop or to try and reduce it to maybe 50, something's better than nothing. Guys, I'm missing one important thing. Which people underestimate, to be fair. Okay, so I'm the patient, okay? You as the doctor, you tell me. Right, so this is the, um, you know, my God, I'm playing doctor and patient. This is funny. Anyways, um, you as the doctor tell me, these are your x-ray results. It is a diagnosis of, do you guys want to just put that in the chat? 
diagnostic of what condition when you see severe degeneration of the right hip joint? Osteoarthritis, lovely, perfect. You guys nailed it on the head. You guys are going to become great doctors, okay? Most 75 year olds come with osteoarthritis because everybody has wear and tear. God knows I might have wear and tear, but anyways, perfect, okay? So you tell, right, see Mr. XYZ. I, as per your x-ray, I can say that you do have a case, you know, you do have osteoarthritis and it's it's not even just mild to moderate. It's become to the severe extent of it. Now, I say, okay. And then I go, well, ideally, I would like to refer you to the orthopedic department for um, replacement. Isn't it? That's what I'm hoping everybody wanted to referral to the orthopedics for. And this guy goes off on you, okay? Now I'm the patient, I said, I have not given you consent for referring me for a replacement. I do not want a replacement. Uh-oh, you're stuck. He doesn't want a replacement. Apparently what he says is he's seen a lot of his friends who's had replacements done before. And they're all in more severe pain than what they had gone in with. And in my head, I'm like, oh, F, I'm stuck. Now, uh, now I am going as a doctor into full-blown panic mode, okay? Because, great, he doesn't want referral. What the hell does he want with me now? Yeah, you relay his fears. He wants this sorted. He wants... This, he doesn't want to go to referral. He doesn't want to replace it, but he wants to manage it. What are you going to do? What are his options? That's what basically you're going to tell me. What do you think his options are now further? We've talked about lifestyle management. What else can you do, Joel? You can't do anything else, isn't it? 75-year-olds, everybody has capacity, right? Yes, exactly. You assume capacity till they start making really unwise choices. But anyways, everyone has capacity. Exactly. So you, exactly, Raymond, whatever, Raymond just directly messaged me saying analgesics, which is correct. So what you're going to do is you're going to give him, right, if you do not want a referral to orthopedics for a replacement, we are quite restricted with what we can do. You explain that very clearly that there is not, this is just going to keep getting worse. So when this guy had told me this and I'm like, oh my God, I have no idea what do I need to do next? So I cheekily opened up the CKS because I was like, mm, don't know. And, you know, I just kind of relayed CKS management with him. So I was just like, you know what? We can give you a bit of analgesics. Try the topical ibuprofen. I knew it's not going to touch him, but try a bit of topical ibuprofen. If that doesn't help, there is a bit of topical capsaicin also that we can try, which is capsaicin is the, um, do you guys know capsicum? So the red peppers or the green or whatever peppers, it contains a little bit of an enzyme called capsaicin, which basically burns like hell, but kind of causes relief of pain. Weird mechanism. Anyways, capsaicin is something that we could try. We can try him on a stepping, you know, the step ladder or the pain ladder. And then I think the only other thing that I could possibly do for him is refer him to physiotherapy as well. Because I'm like, well, I don't know if physiotherapy can help you, but if they can try and get you to do a little bit more, uh, you know, better exercises in relation to your osteoarthritis, great. So that's that. But it's a, it's very difficult, difficult to kind of try and reason with these people. And the dude actually has a little bit of a sense, you know, because first of all, he's 75. He's not going to get assessed by an orthopedic till he's probably reached the age of 78. With his worsening diet, he's not going to... Yeah. 
great burns more than the pain so that's the how capsaicin works i particularly do not like burn or pain so i would definitely not do that for myself but yeah for people some for some of them it works wonders anyways now this guy is a little bit practical because first of all he's 75 by the time he reaches orthopedics he will be 78 just to be assessed by the orthopedics or you know even if he's assessed earlier by the time he gets to surgery he'll be 78 and then he needs physiotherapy after he finishes the replacement for him to start learning how to walk on his replaced hip that's going to take him a couple of years because he's not as young as, as he is before in the meantime, we have to sit and wonder, oh my God, okay, he's got his atrial flutter happening there. We need to figure out on his edoxaban before and after. You know, the whole shebang is there. And he's just thinking, if I, if that pain still doesn't go off after the, uh, after the um, replacement, is it worth it? Is it worth it him who is probably an anesthetic risk to go under anesthesia, get his entire left or right hip, whatever, replaced, taking several weeks to months to try and get him in physio and get him mobilized again for him to end up anyways with a walking aid because not a lot of people after a hip replacement are actually going to walk on their own. And this guy's a bit on the you know obese side of things as well. So he's not going to start you know running on his own. So... So that's something that you need to think about. Did this case make sense? Are you guys happy with this case or is there anything else that you want to talk about this case? Right, sorry, I was going to, I forgot this management plan. First line of an allergy is if uh, pain is present. Now this guy was absolutely marvelous. He did not have any pain except for the nighttime pain for which he manages with a pillow. So I was like, you know what? Start off with a bit of paracetamol if the pain is going really bad and then we'll hike it up. As I said, application of ice and heat works for some people. It doesn't work for a lot of people. Loss of weight and exercise does help. Physiotherapy. Now, corticosteroid injection is a bit of a, hit and miss all over the country in particularly where i am at the moment hip corticosteroid injections are usually done under uh, ultrasound guidance we don't do it in surgery but in practice like in the surgery we do carpal tunnel we do shoulder we do uh, ankle heel all those little little bits and bobs we do except for hip because we have to kind of go through certain structures and we do not want to hit the wrong structure all right and finally you can only offer them surgical management a lot of people will be like put me on the list um, i will see when it comes you know kind of thing so that's basically the management plan now if i have to do a cbd with you guys in terms of this what are the issues identified in this particular case now if I was a trainee, my first issue or the first roadblock that I had in this entire case was the fact that I did not know what the you know, possible differentials could be. That was one. Secondly, I did not expect this guy to say no for a referral. So I didn't know what the next management plan is going to be. Right? So these are the little bit of an issues over there. And thirdly, he was a little bit adamant on he wanted a diagnosis in the initial aspect as well. So kind of a few roadblocks there. But then what was done well, I would have told my trainer that I was able to get through all of this by trying reassuring the patient and going through CKS as well or going through the NICE guidelines to tell him or to convey what I want to do. Do you guys think there was any ethical issues in this case? Anybody know what exactly I mean by ethical issues or, you know, was there anything? Silence it is again. I'm just going to answer this. No, there were no ethical issues in this case. All right. 
And the things that I would possibly link in my portfolio and things like that, in particularly in regards to this case, is firstly, data gathering and management skills. That is what I think I've done well. My clinical examination, because I was able to elicit the fact that he had hip restriction um, on abduction or whatever, and community orientation in terms of there is a community physiotherapist of that I should be aware of that helps people with osteoarthritis. So this is where a CVD is very helpful. So if I have to look at all of your, whether for you, you know, this CVD would have been good or bad. Yes, I think the CVD would have been great. For some of you, I would have said, just work on a bit of your differential diagnosis a bit more. For some of you, I would have said, think basic first. I was told this when I joined general practice before I, you know, after my hospital rotations was like, Stop thinking the worst. Keep it in the back of your head, but stop thinking it in the first instance itself. Start with the basics. If I had a patient come in with a cold or a cough, and I'd be like, oh my God, chest infection, pneumonia, you know, chronic rhinitis, God knows what more I would have thought about. And they were just like, why don't you just start with the most simplest things first, saying that he might have hay fever. So think about all of that, Okay. Are you guys ready for case two? This is going to be a short one, I pre I promise. Not going to be me going off. I don't mind the thumbs up as well. Or do you guys want to break? Whichever. I'm more than happy. Break or go ahead. That's what I'm trying to think about. I'm going to wait. Great. Okay. So case two. This is a bit of a it's a bit of a different one. So um let's see. Okay, how you guys go through this. So now you have your case where you've got a five-year-old boy who comes with comes in with his mother, and she's complaining that he is hard of hearing. The nursery that he goes to also has informed him that um inform the mother that you know they have seen similar issues what the mother particularly says is that the boy will not hear you if you're faced away from him but who understands when he's looking at you you look at the vitals the vitals are stable okay the mother i'm just going to tell you a bit more information about this case the mother particularly told tells me that when she's in the other room and she's trying to call her son her son will not hear. Rather, she has to go to the other room, tap him, and that's when he will hear. Okay? He doesn't complain of any pain. He doesn't complain of any itching, no discharge, no fever, nothing of that sort. He does not have hay fever or anything. And the vitals are stable. What would you do next? Or what would you ask if you had to ask further history? Absolutely correct. You will ask about his development, right? When was this noticed? Does, is there any delay in any of the other development? Prenatal history of any complications or infections? I would also ask about, yes, vaccinations is also something that I would ask about. Developmental delays, yeah. I would also ask about whether she had a history of drug abuse in prenatal time. Or regardless of drug abuse, I would also ask if she's actually took any kind of antibiotics during her prenatal time. Or was the boy given any antibiotics recently? Does anybody know what antibiotics I'm talking about? Correct, gentamicin. And gentamicin is autotoxic, so you never give this for children or anybody. Well, you give it for children, but you give very small amounts. And especially for pregnant women, we never give gentamicin because it can cause autotoxicity. Any uh, tetracycline, yes, exactly. So any anything else that you will ask? 
You asked about um, how long has this been going for? The mother has noticed this since the last two, three months. He, the mother apparently tells you that she hasn't noticed any development delays for him till date. It's only his hearing that she has noticed recently. What else? Has he got the flu in the past month? Exactly, because one of the most important things is vestibular neuronitis, which can be due to a flu. If you've got the flu in the past few months or the past few weeks, you can have um, hearing loss. What else? There's one very important thing that I'm hoping all of you does do kind of text on. Regardless, you've got you. You're in the setting. What would you say? What would you tell this particular patient? Vaccination up to date. Yes, we've got somebody who said that already. Social history. Do you want to expand a little bit more about social history? What exactly are you trying to figure out when you ask him about social history? Is he going to nursery? So as I've said, that he is going to nursery. Yes, he's five years old. He does not have a sibling as yet, but the mother is pregnant. What are you thinking about when, when you know you've said whether the sibling has a similar history? What what is the differential that you guys are thinking about? Viral infections, yes. Yes, that's one thing that we can do. What else? Genetic issues, yes. Would you just ask child abuse? Very good. I am very glad somebody's told that. That's... One of the things also that you're going to have to ask whether there is a bit of child abuse. Well, you can't ask about child abuse, but you have to assess whether they've got NAI or child abuse or non-accidental injuries or things like that. But in terms of sibling history, if you are trying to figure out whether there's a genetic issue, you possibly wouldn't ask about sibling history. You would ask about whether the parents have any problem. Right, if the parents have any hearing issues or if there's any hearing issues in the family in terms of grandparents or things like that. Obviously, grandparents, as soon as they grow older, they definitely have a bit of hearing loss. But if there's something that started at a very young age, what condition am I talking about? ENT is a bit hard, isn't it? <laughs> if I'm going to tell you, I'll just make this a little bit more simpler. Um, the father has a history of hearing loss at the age of 40. His father or their, their children's grandfather had a similar history at the age of 50. Anything clicks? Anything clicks? Okay, one more clue. It is a conductive hearing loss. Anything? Exactly. Osteosclerosis. 
Now, a conductive hearing loss has something to do with the bones or with the conduction of airways. And that's usually done by the bones of our ear. Now, when we when the bones start to rot in osteosclerosis, unfortunately, that is a genetic issue. And you kind of see that with children or with fam within the family history. OK, so now I'm just going to come back to this case again. What do you think in terms of this case? Just by this very short, brief history that you've got in front of you, what do you think? You've told me a lot of diagnosis. Otitis media, yep, could be, we never know. This boy could have a lot of things. Now, what would you do? Now, that's another question. Now, how would you assess this five-year-old boy? I wouldn't particularly do Weber and Rini for a five-year-old because, my God, if they can tell me where they can hear the proper hearing from, they, their IQ must be more than mine. But... Unfortunately, that's a bit tricky with children. You can do an otoscopy. Yes. What is one of the basic tests that you can do for a child without like shoving otoscopes or, you know, bringing out tuning? Whisper test. Exactly. Does everybody know what a whisper test is? No, nobody knows what a whisper test is for children. Exactly. Exactly. Raymond, you are correct. So um, you rub the hands on the triggers and whisper a number. So now what I tend to do for a five-year-old or for children is I don't really say a number. What I tend to do is I do this. So I go next to their ears, okay, pull the hair back or whatever, and then I just keep doing this. Just keep rubbing your hands. And I ask them, is there, can you hear it? First question, can you hear it? And if they say yes, can you hear it better on one ear or the other? And if they, they usually tend to point. They won't say yes or no, but they tend to point. So you know, okay, there is something, something wrong with this particular ear. So confirm what, firstly confirm which ear is the problem there. Okay. Then, yes, you would go ahead with an otoscopy and, you know, Rini Weber is a little bit of an off and on thing with children, but you would go ahead with an otoscopy. And what do you, what do you try to look for? Yes, somebody said otitis media. This child could have otitis media. What are you going to look for in otitis media when you do an otoscopy? You've shopped the autos autoscope in. You've looked at the ear. How are you going to make a diagnosis of otitis media? Cone of light? Yes. Inflammation of what? The ear canal? Bulging tympanic membrane. That's basically what we do. Yes, reddening of the tympanic. So basically, the tympanic membrane looks awful. Okay, the tympanic membrane does not look normal. That's the first thing I'm going to say. The tympanic membrane does not look normal. Okay, it usually tends to bulge. You do not have the cone of light. And you sometimes can appreciate uh, air fluid level, but not always. You've done that. What else are you hoping to see when you do an autoscope? Forget about otitis media. What's the next differential that you'll think about? It's a five-year-old. You can't see autosclerosis, so don't think about that. Something very basic. Too much earwax. Exactly. Impacted earwax. For children, that is one of the most common causes of reduced hearing is when they have so much wax in their ears and they can't do anything about it. They can't tell you that they have wax. It might not hurt them, but you have to look inside. 
okay, to figure out what's exactly happening. So we've talked about any further questions, okay? What would you do next? We've talked about you know a few differential diagnoses all of you have given me. Now, I'm going to tell you, you've looked inside the ear, yes, there is a bit of wax, but not in terms of impacted wax. What is your management plan? What are you going to do next? What are you going to tell the mum? There's a bit of wax, not too much. How are you going to guide that consultation forward? Nobody? Nobody want to tell me exactly what's... Should I just comment myself then? Okay, if nobody's going to know this, what, I'm, what I tend to do in these kind of situations is even if there's a little bit of wax or, you know, if there's wax that I can see that's possibly just covering very light wax, lack of hearing could be your wax present or it could be something else refer to ENT I would usually first you are correct but what I would first do is ask the mum to give a bit of you know olive oil drops or sodium bicarbonate that is basically what is the treatment for your wax put that in assess him in a week's time and see if you know the hearing loss is still you know, present or it's still same. If it still persists, the next step for, for me would be a referral. Pediatric ENT is, is there in some of the trusts. But you know what? This patient now, you refer to ENT, okay? ENT is going to bring this boy in. What do you think they are going to do? What do you think ENT's next step of management would be? Nobody knows what ENT's next step of management would be for a child who's got low, hard of hearing. Forget a child. If it's even if it's an elderly person, what do you think when a patient? Yes, hearing aid is definitely something that is one extreme, but one of the main investigations. What would ENT do, or what would you do? for a patient who goes to ENT. So I've gone, I've gone to ENT, right? So I'm the ENT specialist there. I come in and he goes like, yep, yeah, I've got hearing loss. I can't hear anything. What would you do as the ENT specialist? What is your next investigation? audiogram guys that's exactly what i wanted to hear you would do an audiogram because you have to assess for this child whether it's a sensory neural hearing loss or if it's a conductive hearing loss isn't it your management plan is basically going to go from there so the first thing that you're going to do is either you can refer to ent but i rather refer to audiology if they take children if they don't it goes to ent but it depends on trust deanery to deanery trust to trust as to what they what their usual protocol is but i tend to over here we can directly refer to audio or audiology for children so i tend to do that and then they do the audiogram and if they think okay there's definitely something going absolutely haywire here they immediately refer to ent themselves or you refer to ent and ent does an audiogram but that's one thing that you have to remember for anybody coming with a hearing problem. If there is no wax or if there's very minimal amount of wax, the next step or the next possible investigation is 
an audiogram, whether you are 75 or whether you are two. Okay. Now, just a little bit more. This is one of the last slides. Um, now, mother is unhappy that you've informed her to try a bit of over-the-counter medications for the ear wax, but would like to be referred now. She starts to slowly talk louder and louder till she reach, she's reached a point of yelling. Now, as usual, it's a mother. She's got a child who um, feels we are delaying her treatment by not referring her now and threatens you to take you to court for delay of management of her child. What would you do? Now, this is a bit of comm skills that I've put in here just to see what would be your state of mind at that point of time. What, what is your next, how are you going to either get out of the situation? You stand by your decision, okay. What else? You're in a room, the mother's charged you. She starts yelling at you saying that, you're not doing enough for my child. You are being absolutely lazy. You are delaying the management. What if he, you know, loses hearing completely and he will be a, a difficult boy or he will be a disabled boy? Will you take accountability for that? <laughs> I love it. Whoever said, check if I have a BFA membership is, guys, Absolutely, hands, I love it, applause for you. But yes, uh, check if you have a BOA membership and indemnity, by the way, you need, you need both. Um, suggest her to go private if they can't wait, document everything, give her the referral, and MD it too. <laughs> okay. I think in terms of pediatrics, right? It's a very difficult specialty, what I feel is because you have to kind of look after the child, but also the parents. And parents become very, they become impossible when something's happening to their child, right? Is anybody a parent over here? Having a backbone is important as a physician, lol. That is correct. Amen, that is absolutely correct. But... I just want to know if anybody is a parent over here or if anybody has done babysitting or if anybody is, you know, has looked after children or anything of that sort or, you know, has seen your brothers and sisters look after their child. Have you seen the fear in their parents when, you know, something happens to them? It is very real. Okay, it is absolutely very real when patients start worrying about the child. Now, if I was in this situation, what I would do is, first of all, shut up and not aggravate the situation by standing in my decision. Rather, I would just keep quiet. I would document, yes, but I would keep quiet till she calms down. I would agree with her till she calms down. Once she's taken her volume a bit more lower, I will then explain. Firstly, being very transparent with her, saying that it is inappropriate for her to yell because sometimes that can lead to instant removal from the practice list. Now, because I'm coming from a GP practice, uh, GP trainee perspective, this is something if anybody, any one of you are doing a GP rotation, it'll be very, you know, just keep this in mind that if anybody starts, if you feel threatened, you can always, always send them a warning letter saying that they will be removed. Or if it's massively threatening, you can remove them instantly. I very, two days back, one of my GP consultants had a patient barge into the room, throw her bag into the room. She had no uh, appointment, nothing. She opened the door to call a patient. She walked into the room, barged into the room, sat there and yelled beyond anybody's recognition. She is an instant removal, but he felt threatened because what if she had a knife in that bag, right? 
what if she had anything in that bag to kind of just stab him? What if she had his scissors in his bag? So it is very, very important to try and diffuse the situation. Now, as a doctor, unfortunately, you have to diffuse the situation if you can. If you can't, and all the practices have a panic button, which you press, where people can come running into the room. Ideally, when you see a patient, you need to be at the side of the door so that if the situation gets worse, you can just run out of the door. But most of the practices are not built like that. Most of the practices have the patient coming in and sitting right next to the door. So, as I think Dr. Emma has definitely said, empathize most of the time. But then, and yeah, threats just make me unwilling to compromise. Fine. That's absolutely fine. Now, when you have a mother like this, first of all, I would rather empathize. I would just keep quiet for the first two minutes. Just keep quiet, nod, agree, keep quiet. Once she calms down, let her know that it is absolutely inappropriate for her to yell. And you are doing what you think is right, is best for the child. And there's no harm in there. There's no harm that you want to do willingly for the child. Okay. Secondly, she is now basically saying, I want a referral done. Your job is to basically tell her that even if you do a referral, they will reject it until unless you've tried all the over-the-counter medications for a good period of time. Most of the people who know the NHS will understand that. But to all of the people who are coming into the NHS or are, you know, joining in as F1 doctors or F2 doctors or whatever. Remember that sometimes in the NHS, wherever you are, you need to make sure that you are a bit safe. Sometimes you have to give in. And you can stand by your decision, yes, but recent if you've seen GMC and MDU's all recent complaints that's been given, GMC tends to side with the patients than with doctors is what I've seen. So just beware of that fact and diffuse the situation if you can. But hey ho, not to scare you. This is basically, it happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, it happens. You will get patients who get very angry with you. I had a patient, 58-year-old patient, who came in saying that I have cancer of my face. I've been putting um, effudix. Effudix is um, a 5 fluorouracil which is the cancer drug. I have been putting all of this on my face and it's reacting. That means I know I have cancer. She sat in for half an hour complaining about how shit the NHS system was. I agreed with her. Because there's no point in trying to reason with this woman. And in the end, I, and she asked me, can you just prescribe me more effudix? Because I know this is cancer. And I said, no. And I stood by my decision. I said, no. And she was like, okay, if you're not going to give me, I'm just going to ask my normal GP. I was like, go right ahead. Three weeks later, the GP is also written. No. So yes, you can stand by your decisions and in most of the time when it's not justified. In this particular case, yes, it's still not justified, but understand also sometimes where the, where the patients are coming from. If they have absolutely like ridiculous and rubbish requests, yes, don't give two Fs about it. But sometimes you have to kind of bend over rather than you know standing your decision you can obviously inform them because in the end the mother has the right isn't it now if you if this patient had a non-accidental injury and if you confirmed that you know okay this is possibly because of abuse what's the next step that you'll do anybody Oh gosh, I've just realized I've taken all the time. Right, I've talked about this. Uh, body language awareness. Body language is also very important. Sit down. 
if she stands up be at the level of the patient of the um doctor or of the patient if she stands up you stand up be at the level do not crouch down but you all need to be there body language be open don't be close don't sit like this when she's sitting and screaming at you she's going to think that you are the most you uh arrogant doctor ever and just be aware that the child is present in the room so you need to be very very mindful of the fact that the child is seeing this the question is whether this is a safeguarding issue in regards to child abuse yes you will inform the police you will um i sometimes send the patients to a and e as well to have a complete checkup because they have more resources and i do a safeguarding referral as well and if the situation does not diffuse panic button press it let people come and save you because there's no point okay i've spoken loads today all right right what did you find the most difficult in this case now if i have to answer this it will be the the fact that i couldn't reason with the patient one and the case went into a complete ticking time bomb what i would have said that if you what you did well would be the fact that you tried to diffuse it okay these are the questions that you can actually get in a cbd when the trainer is asking you you know what did you find the most difficult in this case you need to make sure that you express what exactly was the difficult points but how you came up with this difficult points is also very important and the trainer will try and make as much as positive feedback but also will give you a little bit of feedback in terms of you know okay what could you have done better the next time just keep in mind that the next time you could do this as well just to increase your knowledge okay right i am done anybody has any other further questions I'm going to stop sharing my screen. You guys can follow me on Instagram if you want to. I put the um the my little tagline there.